way of the heart. Solitude. Introduction. St. Anthony, the father of monks, is the best guide in our attempt to understand the role of solitude in ministry. Born around 251, Anthony was the son of Egyptian peasants. When he was about 18 years old, he heard in church the gospel words, Go and sell what you own, and give the money to the poor. Then come and follow me. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. Anthony realized that these words were meant for him personally. After a period of living as a poor laborer at the edge of his village, he withdrew into the desert, where for twenty years he lived in complete solitude. During these years, Anthony experienced a terrible trial. The shell of his superficial securities was cracked, and the abyss of iniquity was opened to him. But he came out of this trial victoriously, not because of his own willpower or ascetic exploits, but because of his unconditional surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When he emerged from his solitude, people recognized in him the qualities of an authentic, healthy man, whole in body, mind, and soul. They flocked to him for healing, comfort, and direction. In his old age, Anthony retired to an even deeper solitude to be totally absorbed in direct communion with God. He died in the year 356 when he was about 106 years old. The story of St. Anthony, as told by St. Athanasius, shows that we must be made aware of the call to let our false, compulsive self be transformed into the new self of Jesus Christ. It also shows that solitude is the furnace in which this transformation takes place. Finally, it reveals that it is from this transformed or converted self that real ministry flows. I therefore propose to explore these three aspects of St. Anthony's life in the hope of uncovering the problems as well as the opportunities in our ministry. The Compulsive Minister Thomas Merton writes in the introduction to his The Wisdom of the Desert, Society was regarded by the Desert Fathers as a shipwreck from which each single individual man had to swim for his life. These were men who believed that to let oneself drift along, passively accepting the tenets and values of what they knew as society, was purely and simply a disaster. This observation leads us straight to the core of the problem. Our society is not a community radiant with the love of Christ, but a dangerous network of domination and manipulation in which we can easily get entangled and lose our soul. The basic question is whether we ministers of Jesus Christ have not already been so deeply molded by the seductive powers of our dark world that we have become blind to our own and other people's fatal state and have lost the power and motivation to swim for our lives. Just look for a moment at our daily routine. In general, we are very busy people. We have many meetings to attend, many visits to make, many services to lead. Our calendars are filled with appointments our days and weeks filled with engagements, and our years filled with plans and projects. There is seldom a period in which we do not know what to do, and we move through life in such a distracted way that we do not even take the time and rest to wonder if any of the things we think, say, or do are worth thinking, saying, or doing. We simply go along with the many musts and oughts that have been handed to us, and we live with them as if they were authentic translations of the gospel of our Lord. People must be motivated to come to church, youth must be entertained, money must be raised, and above all, everyone must be happy. Moreover, we ought to be on good terms with the church and civil authorities, we ought to be liked or at least respected by a fair majority of our parishioners, we ought to move up in the ranks according to schedule, and we ought to have enough vacation and salary to live a comfortable life. Thus, we are busy people just like all other busy people, rewarded with the rewards which are rewarded to busy people. All this is simply to suggest how horrendously secular our ministerial lives tend to be. Why is this so? Why do we children of the light so easily become conspirators with the darkness? The answer is quite simple. Our identity, our sense of self, is at stake. Secularity is a way of being dependent on the responses of our milieu. The secular or false self is the self which is fabricated, as Thomas Merton says, by social compulsions. Compulsive is indeed the best adjective for the false self. 
it points to the need for ongoing and increasing affirmation. Who am I? I am the one who is liked, praised, admired, disliked, hated, or despised. Whether I am a pianist, a businessman, or a minister, what matters is how I am perceived by my world. If being busy is a good thing, then I must be busy. If having money is a sign of real freedom, then I must claim my money. If knowing many people proves my importance, I will have to make the necessary contacts. The compulsion manifests itself in the lurking fear of failing and the steady urge to prevent this by gathering more of the same, more work, more money, more friends. These very compulsions are at the basis of the two main enemies of the spiritual life, anger and greed. They are the inner side of a secular life, the sour fruits of our worldly dependencies. What else is anger than the impulsive response to the experience of being deprived? When my sense of self depends on what others say of me, anger is a quite natural reaction to a critical word. And when my sense of self depends on what I can acquire, greed flares up when my desires are frustrated. Thus, greed and anger are the brother and sister of a false self fabricated by the social compulsions of an unredeemed world. Anger in particular seems close to a professional vice in the contemporary ministry. Pastors are angry at their leaders for not leading, and at their followers for not following. They are angry at those who do not come to church for not coming, and angry at those who do come for coming without enthusiasm. They are angry at their families, who make them feel guilty, and angry at themselves for not being who they want to be. This is not an open, blatant, roaring anger, but an anger hidden behind the smooth word, the smiling face, and the polite handshake. It is a frozen anger, an anger which settles into a biting resentment and slowly paralyzes a generous heart. If there is anything that makes the ministry look grim and dull, it is this dark, insidious anger in the servants of Christ. It is not so strange that Anthony and his fellow monks considered it a spiritual disaster to accept passively the tenets and values of their society. They had come to appreciate how hard it is not only for the individual Christian, but also for the church itself to escape the seductive compulsions of the world. What was their response? They escaped from the sinking ship and swam for their lives. And the place of salvation is called desert, the place of solitude. Let us now see what this solitude did to them. The Furnace of Transformation When Anthony heard the words of Jesus, Go and sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, then come and follow me, he took it as a call to escape from the compulsions of his world. He moved away from his family, lived in poverty in a hut on the edge of his village, and occupied himself with manual work and prayer. But soon he realized that more was required of him. He had to face his enemies, anger and greed, head on, and let himself be totally transformed into a new being. His old, false self had to die, and a new self had to be born. For this, Anthony withdrew into the complete solitude of the desert. Solitude is the furnace of transformation. Without solitude, we remain victims of our society, and continue to be entangled in the illusions of the false self. Jesus himself entered into this furnace. There he was tempted with the three compulsions of the world, to be relevant, turn stones into loaves, to be spectacular, throw yourself down, and to be powerful. I will give you all these kingdoms. There he affirmed God as the only source of his identity. You must worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Solitude is the place of the great struggle and the great encounter, the struggle against the compulsions of the false self, and the encounter with the loving God who offers himself as the substance of the new self. This might sound rather forbidding. It might even evoke images of medieval ascetical pursuits from which Luther and Calvin have happily saved us. But once we have given these fantasies their due and let them wander off, we will see that we are dealing here with that holy place where ministry and spirituality embrace each other. It is the place called solitude. In order to understand the meaning of solitude, we must first unmask the ways in which the idea of solitude has been distorted by our world. We say to each other that we need some solitude in our lives. What we really are thinking of, however, is a time and a place for ourselves in which we are not bothered by other people, 
can think our own thoughts, express our own complaints, and do our own thing, whatever it may be. For us, solitude most often means privacy. We have come to the dubious conviction that we all have a right to privacy. Solitude thus becomes like a spiritual property for which we can compete on the free market of spiritual goods. But there is more. We also think of solitude as a station where we can recharge our batteries, or as the corner of the boxing ring where our wounds are oiled, our muscles massaged, and our courage restored by fitting slogans. In short, we think of solitude as a place where we gather new strength to continue the ongoing competition in life. But that is not the solitude of St. John the Baptist, of St. Anthony or St. Benedict, of Charles de Foucault or the Brothers of Tizé. For them, solitude is not a private therapeutic place. Rather, it is the place of conversion, the place where the old self dies and the new self is born, the place where the emergence of the new man and the new woman occurs. How can we gain a clearer understanding of this transforming solitude? Let me try to describe in more detail the struggle, as well as the encounter, that takes place in this solitude. In solitude, I get rid of my scaffolding. No friends to talk with, no telephone calls to make, no meetings to attend, no music to entertain, no books to distract, just me, naked, vulnerable, weak, sinful, deprived, broken, nothing. It is this nothingness that I have to face in my solitude a nothingness so dreadful that everything in me wants to run to my friends, my work, and my distractions so that I can forget my nothingness and make myself believe that I am worth something. But that is not all. As soon as I decide to stay in my solitude, confusing ideas, disturbing images, wild fantasies, and weird associations jump about in my mind like monkeys in a banana tree. Anger and greed begin to show their ugly faces. I give long, hostile speeches to my enemies and dream lustful dreams in which I am wealthy, influential, and very attractive, or poor, ugly, and in need of immediate consolation. Thus I try again to run from the dark abyss of my nothingness and restore my false self in all its vainglory. The task is to persevere in my solitude, to stay in my cell until all my seductive visitors get tired of pounding on my door and leave me alone. The Eisenheim altar, painted by Grunwald, shows with frightening realism the ugly faces of the many demons who tempted Anthony in his solitude. The struggle is real because the danger is real. It is the danger of living the whole of our life as one long defense against the reality of our condition, one restless effort to convince ourselves of our virtuousness. Yet Jesus did not come to call the virtuous, but sinners. Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. That is the struggle. It is the struggle to die to our false self. But this struggle is far, far beyond our own strength. Anyone who wants to fight his demons with his own weapons is a fool. The wisdom of the desert is that the confrontation with our own frightening nothingness forces us to surrender ourselves totally and unconditionally to the Lord Jesus Christ. Alone we cannot face the mystery of iniquity with impunity. Only Christ can overcome the powers of evil. Only in and through Him can we survive the trials of our solitude. This is beautifully illustrated by Abba Elias, who said, An old man was living in a temple, and the demons came to say to him, Leave this place which belongs to us. And the old man said, No place belongs to you. Then they began to scatter his palm leaves about, one by one, and the old man went on gathering them together with persistence. A little later, the devil took his hand and pulled him to the door. When the old man reached the door, he seized the lintel with the other hand, crying out, Jesus, save me. Immediately the devil fled away. Then the old man began to weep. Then the Lord said to him, Why are you weeping? And the old man said, Because the devils have dared to seize a man and treat him like this. The Lord said to him, You had been careless. As soon as you turned to me again, you see, I was beside you. This story shows that only in the context of the great encounter with Jesus Christ himself can a real, authentic struggle take place. The encounter with Christ does not take place before, after, or beyond the struggle with our false self and its demons. No, it is precisely in the midst of this struggle that our Lord comes to us and says, 
as he said to the old man in the story, as soon as you turned to me again, you see I was beside you. We enter into solitude, first of all, to meet our Lord and to be with Him and Him alone. Our primary task in solitude, therefore, is not to pay undue attention to the many faces which assail us, but to keep the eyes of our mind and heart on Him who is our divine Savior. Only in the context of grace can we face our sin. Only in the place of healing do we dare to show our wounds. Only with a single-minded attention to Christ can we give up our clinging fears and face our own true nature. As we come to realize that it is not we who live, but Christ who lives in us, that He is our true self, we can slowly let our compulsions melt away and begin to experience the freedom of the children of God. And then we can look back with a smile and realize that we aren't even angry or greedy anymore. What does all of this mean for us in our daily life? Even when we are not called to the monastic life or do not have the physical constitution to survive the rigors of the desert, we are still responsible for our own solitude. Precisely because our secular milieu offers us so few spiritual disciplines, we have to develop our own. We have indeed to fashion our own desert where we can withdraw every day, shake off our compulsions, and dwell in the gentle healing presence of our Lord. Without such a desert, we will lose our own soul while preaching the gospel to others. But with such a spiritual abode, we will become increasingly conformed to Him in whose name we minister. The very first thing we need to do is set apart a time and a place to be with God and Him alone. The concrete shape of this discipline of solitude will be different for each person, depending on individual character, ministerial task, and milieu. But a real discipline never remains vague or general. It is as concrete and specific as daily life itself. When I visited Mother Teresa of Calcutta a few years ago and asked her how to live out my vocation as a priest, she simply said, Spend one hour a day in adoration of your Lord and never do anything you know is wrong, and you will be all right. She might have said something else to a married person with young children and something else again to someone who lives in a larger community. But like all great disciples of Jesus, Mother Teresa affirmed again the truth that ministry can be fruitful only if it grows out of a direct and intimate encounter with our Lord. Thus the opening words of St. John's first letter echo down through history. Something we have heard, and we have seen with our own eyes, that we have watched and touched with our hands, the Word who is life. This is our subject. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Solitude is thus the place of purification and transformation, the place of the great struggle and the great encounter. Solitude is not simply a means to an end. Solitude is its own end. It is the place where Christ remodels us in His own image and frees us from the victimizing compulsions of the world. Solitude is the place of our salvation. Hence, it is the place where we want to lead all who are seeking the light in this dark world. St. Anthony spent twenty years in isolation. When he left it, he took his solitude with him and shared it with all who came to him. Those who saw him described him as balanced, gentle, and caring. He had become so Christ-like, so radiant with God's love, that his entire being was ministry. Let me now try to show how a compassionate ministry flows from a transformed self. A Compassionate Ministry Anthony's life after he had emerged from his period of total isolation was blessed by a rich and varied ministry. People from many walks of life came to him and asked for advice. The solitude that at first had required physical isolation had now become a quality of his heart, an inner disposition that could no longer be disturbed by those who needed his guidance. Somehow his solitude had become an infinite space into which anyone could be invited. His advice was simple, direct, and concrete. Someone asked him, What must one do in order to please God? The old man replied, Pay attention to what I tell you. Whoever you may be, always have God before your eyes. Whatever you do, do it according to the testimony of the Holy Scriptures. In whatever place you live, do not easily leave it. Keep these three precepts, and you will be saved. To Abba Pambo, who asked him, What ought I to do? The old man said, do not trust in your own righteousness. Do not worry about the past, but control your tongue and your stomach. 
And looking into the future, Anthony said with words which have an eerie timeliness, A time is coming when men will go mad, and when they see someone who is not mad, they will attack him, saying, You are mad, you are not like us. Through the struggle with his demons and the encounter with his Lord, Anthony had learned to diagnose the hearts of people and the mood of his time, and thus to offer insight, comfort, and consolation. Solitude had made him a compassionate man. Here we reach the point where ministry and spirituality touch each other. It is compassion. Compassion is the fruit of solitude and the basis of all ministry. The purification and transformation that take place in solitude manifest themselves in compassion. Let us not underestimate how hard it is to be compassionate. Compassion is hard because it requires the inner disposition to go with others to the place where they are weak, vulnerable, lonely, and broken. But this is not our spontaneous response to suffering. What we desire most is to do away with suffering by fleeing from it or finding a quick cure for it. As busy, active, relevant ministers, we want to earn our bread by making a real contribution. This means, first and foremost, doing something to show that our presence makes a difference. And so we ignore our greatest gift, which is our ability to enter into solidarity with those who suffer. It is in solitude that this compassionate solidarity grows. In solitude we realize that nothing human is alien to us, that the roots of all conflict, war, injustice, cruelty, hatred, jealousy, and envy are deeply anchored in our own heart. In solitude our heart of stone can be turned into a heart of flesh, a rebellious heart into a contrite heart, and a closed heart into a heart that can open itself to all suffering people in a gesture of solidarity. If you would ask the Desert Fathers why solitude gives birth to compassion, they would say, because it makes us die to our neighbor. At first this answer seems quite disturbing to a modern mind, but when we give it a closer look, we can see that in order to be of service to others, we have to die to them. That is, we have to give up measuring our meaning and value with the yardstick of others. To die to our neighbors means to stop judging them, to stop evaluating them, and thus to become free to be compassionate. Compassion can never coexist with judgment because judgment creates the distance, the distinction, which prevents us from really being with the other. Much of our ministry is pervaded with judgments. Often, quite unconsciously, we classify our people as very good, good, neutral, bad, and very bad. These judgments influence deeply the thoughts, words, and actions of our ministry. Before we know it, we fall into the trap of the self-fulfilling prophecy. Those whom we consider lazy, indifferent, hostile, or obnoxious, we treat as such, forcing them in this way to live up to our own views. And so, much of our ministry is limited by the snares of our own judgments. These self-created limits prevent us from being available to people and shrivel up our compassion. Do not judge, and you will not be judged yourselves, is a word of Jesus that is indeed very hard to live up to. But it contains the secret of a compassionate ministry. This becomes clear in many stories from the desert. Abba Moses, one of St. Anthony's followers, said to a brother, To die to one's neighbor is this, to bear your own faults and not to pay attention to anyone else wondering whether they are good or bad. Do no harm to anyone. Do not think anything bad in your heart towards anyone. Do not scorn the man who does evil. Do not put confidence in him who does wrong to his neighbor. Do not rejoice with him who injures his neighbor. Do not have hostile feelings toward anyone. And do not let dislike dominate your heart. And with the typically graphic imagery of the desert, everything is summarized with the words, It is folly for a man who has a dead person in his house to leave him there and go to weep over his neighbor's dead. Solitude leads to the awareness of the dead person in our own house and keeps us from making judgments about other people's sins. In this way, real forgiveness becomes possible. The following desert story offers a good illustration. A brother committed a fault. A council was called to which Abba Moses was invited, but he refused to go to it. Then the priest sent someone to say to him, Come, for everyone is waiting for you. So he got up and went. He took a leaking jug, filled it with water, and carried it with him. The others came out to meet him and said to him, 
What is this, father? The old man said to them, My sins run out behind me, and I do not see them. And today I am coming to judge the error of another. When they heard that, they said no more to the brother, but forgave him. What becomes visible here is that solitude molds self-righteous people into gentle, caring, forgiving persons who are so deeply convinced of their own great sinfulness and so fully aware of God's even greater mercy that their life itself becomes ministry. In such a ministry there is hardly any difference left between doing and being. When we are filled with God's merciful presence, we can do nothing other than minister because our whole being witnesses to the light that has come into the darkness. Here are two desert stories that show this tender, compassionate ministry. Of Abba Amonas, a disciple of Anthony, it is said that in his solitude he advanced to the point where his goodness was so great that he took no notice of wickedness. Thus, having become a bishop, someone brought a young girl who was pregnant to him, saying, See what this unhappy wretch has done. Give her a penance. But he, having marked the young girl's womb with the sign of the cross, commanded that six pairs of fine linen sheets should be given her, saying, It is for fear that, when she comes to give birth, she may die, she or the child, and have nothing for the burial. But her accusers resumed, Why did you do that? Give her a punishment. But he said to them, Look, brothers, she is near to death. What am I to do? Then he sent her away and no old man dared accuse anyone any more. This story illustrates beautifully how the compassionate person is so aware of the suffering of others that it is not even possible for him or her to dwell on their sins. The second story makes clear how extremely careful and sensitive is a compassionate minister. Three old men, of whom one had a bad reputation, came one day to Abba Achilles. The first asked him, Father, make me a fishing net. I will not make you one, he replied. Then the second said, Of your charity make one, so that we may have a souvenir of you in the monastery. But he said, I do not have time. Then the third one, who had a bad reputation, said, Make me a fishing net, so that I may have something from your hands, father. Abba Achilles answered him at once, For you I will make one. Then the other two old men asked him privately, why did you not want to do what we asked you, but you promised to do what he asked? The old man gave them this answer. I told you I would not make one, and you were not disappointed, since you thought that I had no time. But if I had not made one for him, he would have said, The old man has heard about my sin, and that is why he does not want to make me anything. And so our relationship would have broken down. But now I have cheered his soul, so that he will not be overcome with grief. Here, indeed, is ministry in its purest form, a compassionate ministry born of solitude. Anthony and his followers, who escaped the compulsions of the world, did so not out of disdain for people, but in order to be able to save them. Thomas Merton, who described these monks as people who swam for their life in order not to drown in the sinking ship of their society, remarks, They knew that they were helpless to do any good for others as long as they floundered about in the wreckage. But once they got a foothold on solid ground, things were different. Then they had not only the power, but even the obligation to pull the whole world to safety after them. Thus, in and through solitude, we do not move away from people. On the contrary, we move closer to them through compassionate ministry. Conclusion In a world that victimizes us by its compulsions, we are called to solitude where we can struggle against our anger and greed and let our new self be born in the loving encounter with Jesus Christ. It is in this solitude that we become compassionate people, deeply aware of our solidarity and brokenness with all of humanity, and ready to reach out to anyone in need. The end of Anthony's story shows him, after years of compassionate ministry, returning to his solitude to be totally absorbed in direct communion with God. One of the desert stories tells us about a certain old man who asked God to let him see the fathers. God heard his prayer, and the old man saw them all, except Anthony. So he asked his guide, Where is Abba Anthony? He told him in reply that in the place where God is, there Anthony would be.
It is very important for us to realize that Anthony concluded his life in total absorption in God. The goal of our life is not people, it is God. Only in Him shall we find the rest we seek. It is therefore to solitude that we must return, not alone, but with all those whom we embrace through our ministry. This return continues until the time when the same Lord who sent us into the world calls us back to be with Him in a never-ending communion.